Good morning. It is wonderful to see you here on this Lord's Day. If you uh, have a bulletin when you came in, I hope that you got a bulletin. If you have that bulletin, you can take it out and look inside. And I'll point out a few things today about our service. In a few moments, Don will come and he will read for us. Uh, Today, uh, he will read Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. So if you've got a copy of your Bible also, go ahead and take it out. uh, Turn to the book of Romans, and he'll read the first seven verses of Romans chapter 1. Also, as you know, uh, it's our custom here at Grace to pray for other churches in our community. And so today is no different. Today, we pray for our friends at the uh, Manuel Baptist Church. Uh, We pray for Brother Brent and uh, for their services today and throughout the week. As you can see here uh, in the bulletin, we will sing this time of the year. We'll sing a few Christmas uh, carols together. And uh, as you can also see, there's a special music today. Um, Darby Darby Renfro was going to sing, but she woke up with fever this morning. Uh, So yeah, that's kind of going around. So remember her in prayer uh, because um, fever is no fun for sure. But uh, her mom, Leslie, uh, texted and said, I, you know, I hate to leave you like that. I'll sing. And I went, are you serious? <laughs> and uh, she said, yes, yes. And I said, well, how would you like me to introduce you? And she said, mother of the year. <laughs> and so uh, the mother of the year will fill in for her daughter today and sing uh, a beautiful song. Uh, and, and you'll hear that in, uh, in just a little while. Today, uh, in the next few times we gather, uh, we will be thinking about the incarnation of Christ. And um, today we'll look at Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 14, and also Matthew 1, 18 through 24. Also inside your bulletin, uh, the question for this week, question 79 The question is, why then does Christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood, or the new covenant his blood, and use the words, uh, and Paul used the words in sharing in Christ's body and blood? And the answer is, Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that just as bread and wine nourish the temporal life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood are the true food and drink for our souls for eternal life. But more important, he wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance, and that all his suffering and obedience are definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and made satisfaction for our sins. Amen. I hope that you spend time this week with your family. Uh, looking over those verses and thinking about that question. Uh, two, two announcements that I want to make for you. Uh, one is if, you're, if you and your family have not gotten your two copies of these books, they're right up here on the uh, stage. And so after the service, please come and get these two books for you, uh, for you and for your family. And if you'll just sign your family's name so that we know when every family gets a copy of this, Um, and once every family has a copy, if we have leftover copies, then you can get second, third copies, whatever you want. If you want to give them to friends or other family members that are not a part of our church, please do that. But these two books, one is about prayer. This one's about prayer, and uh, this one is about uh, each book of the Bible. So it covers every book of the Bible in question and answer form and kind of walks you through who wrote the book, to whom it was written, what's the main point, and those sorts of things. Issues. So please, please, please avail. These are absolutely free. We had a very generous man donate the money to our generous, I should say, couple. Uh, donate the money to, uh, to pay for these. So they're absolutely free for you and for your family. So please avail yourself to these. The second announcement is this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, I want to invite you to a uh, Wednesday night meal. We're going to eat together this Wednesday night. And uh, Shirley is cooking. I know that took you off guard, so I'm going to say it again and just let that settle, okay? Shirley is cooking. And a women, 
All right, men and women should come, okay? Uh, but what I'd like for you to do is bring, bring a dessert. So if you come, please come. Uh, but if you come, please bring a dessert. All right, so Shirley's going to take care of all the good food so that none of us mess it up. And then we'll just bring the desserts, okay? So this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, everyone, everyone, everyone is invited. I hope to see you here. That Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, will be our last Wednesday night of the year. So the next time we get together, it'll be the new year, okay? So I invite you to that this week, and I hope that you will, will certainly be there, all right? Let's pray together. Let's open our service up, and then Don will come, and he will read Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and the kindness that you've already demonstrated to us in giving us life and sustaining our breath. And as we gathered here today, we pray that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in our knowledge of you, and that you would grow us in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. Grant to us all the benefits of salvation, namely joy and comfort and hope. And we pray for our friends at Emmanuel Baptist Church. We pray that you would incline their hearts to your testimonies, that you would give them eyes to see the truth, hearts to receive and believe the truth. We pray for their pastor and for their staff that you would bless them and make your face to shine upon them and give them light as they seek to lead into the truth. Again, we thank you for this day and we pray these many things in the name of Christ. Amen. Good morning, Grace Baptist, and Merry Christmas. As Kevin said, we will be in Romans 1 this morning, reading verses 1 through 7. Hear God's word. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Christ Jesus. May we pray? God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for allowing us to gather and to hear and be under your precious word. God, we thank you for this season and the meaning of it in Jesus Christ our Lord. Be with Kevin as he teaches, clear as mine. Let his speech be clear to all of us and fall on us with soft hearts. We love your truth, God. We love being able to gather today for this service. We say all these prayers in Christ's precious name. Amen. Good morning, Grace Baptist Church. We're so glad that each of you are here to worship with us. And for those visiting, we're so glad that each of you are here. If everyone would please stand at this time, we are going to sing some songs of praise to the Lord. And be at the Advent season, there'll be some Christmas carols. First will be O Little Town of Bethlehem. We'll sing the first, second, and last stanza. Bye. 
I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have held me through the fire. And in darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been. Of the goodness of God. Cause your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been. So good, every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing 
Thank you for singing that. Such a, such a needed reminder. Um, I, I want to share two verses with you before we, before we look at the sermon, if that's okay. I want you to take your Bible and look with me at Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And I want you to look at verse 6. Psalm 23, verse 6. Now, David wrote this psalm. And um, verse 6, I'm sure many of you know this psalm, perhaps even by heart. The 23rd psalm. But I want you to notice what verse 6 says. Now my version says, Surely... Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That word surely there is, is poorly translated into English. So if you, if you make notes, I would make a note here. The word's not surely. The word is only. Only goodness will follow me all the days of my life. Isn't that beautiful? Now, here's the second verse I want to give you. That was David. David wrote Psalm 23, but David had a son. In fact, he had many sons, but one son in particular, and his name was Solomon. And Solomon wrote the very next book, the book of Proverbs. So I want you to turn to Proverbs 16, verse 20. Proverbs 6, 16, verse 20. Now remember, this man that I'm about to read was trained by David. David, the one who said to you and me just a minute ago, only goodness follows me every day. And this is what Solomon said, Proverbs 16, verse 20. Whoever gives thought to a matter will discover good. How many of you know everything in life is not good? <laughs> well, only goodness follows me? Yes. If you give thought to those things that happened to you that you didn't think was good, God was in that working good for you. So this song kind of struck me. I'm, I, I'm not happy that Darby had fever, but I sure am glad Leslie sang that song. He has been faithful to you and to me, and he has been good. Only goodness follows us, and if we give thought to a matter, we'll discover the good. Amen. All right, let's go home. <laughs> you know better than that. Uh, if you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn with me, please, to uh, Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. Today I'm going to read verses 10 through 14 in Isaiah 7. And as you're turning there, there are two words that I want you to, to think about with me today. The first word is the word promise. Promise. And the second word is the word fulfillment. Promise and fulfillment. Let's pray to our Lord. Let's ask him to bless the reading of his word. And then I will read Isaiah 7 verses 10 through 14. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for not leaving us without your testimony. Thank you for each human through whom you wrote the words that are now contained in this book that we call the Bible. Incline our heart now to your testimonies. Teach us, instruct us, inspire us. Open our eyes to see wonderful things here and satisfy us with your nature, your character, and your ways. Bless the reading of your word. Multiply its benefits to us. That's our prayer. And we make it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10. This is God's word. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to the test. And Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary man that you weary God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> May God bless the reading of his word. and May he add his benefit to our meditation on it on this Lord's day. Before we look at the wonderful promise of verse 14, we really need to set the stage in verses 10 through 14. There's this man named Ahaz, and he's a king. And not only is he a king, but he's actually a descendant of David. If you remember a moment ago, Don read from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, a description of Jesus. And that description included Jesus as a descendant of David. Ahaz is a descendant of David. David is long gone. Solomon is long gone. In fact, the kingdom, the 12 tribes have split. They fractured. Ten tribes are considered the northern ten tribes now. And there are two tribes in the south. God's promise was to David's dynasty. The men who came in his line to rule as king. But long after Solomon... David's son, the kingdom split because the northern ten tribes neglected and even ignored God's word about David being the rightful king over God's people. And so they decided to have a king like they wanted. Isn't that pretty typical of humanity? We all want a king like we want it. Well, those northern ten tribes are really outside of the purview of Isaiah 7. What comes into focus here is really the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And Judah is the line of David, the one that is promised that someone would always sit upon this throne from David. And this particular king, the one that comes from David, is in covenant with God. God has obligated himself to that king in the sense that I will defend you. I will protect you. I will provide for you. And I will preserve you. And all you, king, that's come from David's line have to do is trust me. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? God, being the God that he is, obligates himself and makes covenant with David and all those who come after David. And all David's line must do is trust the Lord with all of their heart. Now, Assyria is the world power in Isaiah 7. They are the ones that are taking over the world and pillaging the world and conquer. Conquering the world. And Assyria is posing a threat to the northern ten tribes. Ahaz is the king of the southern two tribes. 
But as Assyria is moving westward and then south, once they take the northern ten tribes, they're coming after Ahaz and the southern two tribes also. So Ahaz, in his infinite wisdom, instead of trusting in the Lord to protect and to provide, which is what he promised his great-grandfather David, by the way, Ahaz decides to go to Syria, not Assyria, but Syria, and form a coalition to help his southern two tribes fight off Assyrian aggression. This king, Ahaz, is a hypocrite. And it's not as though he's a hypocrite in and of himself, but he is the king, which means that all of those in his kingdom will be treated by his obedience. If this king Ahaz obeys the covenant, then all the people under him will be blessed by his obedience. But if this king disobeys the covenant and incurs the wrath of the covenant, this wrath will be passed on to all of his subjects also. Stop. Do you see the gospel there? Do you see the gospel? God has made a covenant with the line of David that one from David will come and he will be the king and he will obey perfectly and totally and completely and thus secure the blessing of the covenant for all those in his care. Do you see the gospel? Christ Jesus has come as Don read in Romans 7. And it's it's quite interesting. This is the way that Paul describes him. Hello? As a descendant of David. Because as a descendant of David, as the king of God's people, he is in covenant with God and his obedience to God the Father will secure an eternal blessing for his people. Aren't you grateful for Jesus? We do not have a hypocritical king like Ahaz. We have one who humbled himself and became like us and obeyed in our place and now has secured something for us. But back to the hypocrite. Isaiah the prophet, God raises up these prophets to go to the kings. If you read your Old Testament, you'll always see that when prophets are speaking, they're speaking to kings. Because these kings are in covenant with God, but they're human. So they need reminders. Can I get a witness? Humans need reminders. And so Isaiah and every other prophet that operated in that prophetic office goes to the king to remind the king of the covenant. That's their sole responsibility. Whether it's Jeremiah, whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Ezekiel, it doesn't matter who the prophet is. They are going to the kings to remind the kings of the covenant they have with God. And that is the Davidic covenant that God made with David. So Isaiah goes now to Ahaz. So has the stage been set? You know what we're dealing with now? Look at verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as you want it to be, or let it be as high as you want it to be. That is, I will give you a sign that I will protect you, provide for you, and preserve you against the Assyrian threat. You don't need foreign alliances with Syria to fight off the enemies. You need me, God says. And to prove that to you, I'll give you a sign to remind you of the covenant that I made with your great-grandfather David. So ask me whatever you want to ask, as deep as you want it to be, as high as you want it to be, and I will give you a sign. My God, help. Now 
notice what this hypocrite says in verse 12. But Ahaz said, I will not ask for a sign. I will not put the Lord to the test. You liar. The fact that you've gone to a foreign alliance known as Syria and formed a coalition. Formed a coalition with the Syrians to fight off the Assyrians is proof that you're testing the Lord. This man is testing the Lord by his actions and has the audacity with his mouth to say, I won't test the Lord. What a hypocrite. What a feigned hypocrite this is. I want you to notice how Isaiah the prophet responds to him and his hypocrisy. Look at what verse 13 says. This is the way we read it, okay? And he said, hear then, O house of David. That's the way we read it because it's church, right? Yeah. Hear then, O house of David. That's not what he said. There's this little exclamation mark there in English. That's an identifier for you. He yells at Ahaz. I can't do it because the mic's so close. But he shouts at him and he says, You are of the house of David for crying out loud. How dare you say something so hypocritical as you just said. You're in covenant with God and God said that he would protect you. And you've gone off to the Syrians? And now God has said, I will give you a sign to prove that I am your God and I will not leave you and I will not forsake you and I will fulfill my end of this covenant. And you have the audacity now, house of David, Ahaz, to say to God, I'm not going to test him. You hypocrite. That's the Kevin Jackson version. Notice in verse 13 what he says. He says, is it too little for you to weary man? That word weary means, if you're taking notes, it means to emotionally exhaust. Can I ask you a personal question? You don't have to answer out loud. Please, heaven, do not answer out loud. But do you have anybody in your life that just emotionally exhausts you? I said not out loud. I mean, there are just some people that are absolute drains on you, aren't they? There are some people you see coming and go, man, I'm so glad that guy's walking toward me. Or I'm so glad that gal is walking toward me. Because they're just an encouragement to you. There there are people like that. And then there are other people that you go, oh. Because you know they're going to open your emotions and drain them and then walk away from you. That's what the word weary means here. So he says here, is it too little for you to emotionally exhaust the people in your kingdom? Because you, Ahaz, have a responsibility. You're supposed to obey God. And through your obedience, your allegiance to the covenant, the people are secure. But the people now are not secure because you. Because you're not obeying God. You're not keeping your end of the covenant. And so you're emotionally exhausting these people in your care. Can we just stop just for a moment there? And can we say, thank God for Jesus. Because Jesus as our king does not emotionally exhaust us. When we get emotionally exhausted, we can go to him and we know that he is good and faithful. The way that Leslie sang. He doesn't weary us. Have you noticed that about Jesus? He doesn't weary us. Only goodness follows us. And even when things happen to us that are not that good, we we, we think, well, if we just give thought to it, we'll see that God works all things together. He doesn't weary us. He's never wearied us. Now, bad things have happened to us, yes. Lots of bad things have happened. But have you noticed, uh, me and some of the elders were talking about this yesterday, Have you noticed that the bad things actually produce more good than the good things in your life? Have you noticed that? We 
we can go to Jesus because he doesn't emotionally exhaust us. He is the perfect king. Now notice what he goes on to say. Is it too much for you to weary man that you're now wearying God? Boy, that is... I don't know if you caught that or not. You know God cannot be emotionally exhausted, correct? You understand that? But now he says about Ahaz, are you trying to emotionally exhaust God? How bad did this guy's sin look to God and to Isaiah for Isaiah to say, are you trying to weary God? So he says, you know, forget it. Forget it. I'm not going to ask you for a sign because you're a hypocrite. But let me tell you how good God is. This is what Isaiah says. I'm going to tell you how good God is. God is going to give you a sign. Now look at verse 14. And here's the sign. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. There's the sign. The sign is a virgin born child. And the virgin born child has a name. And that name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel is three Hebrew words put together. It means God with us. There's your sign. There's your sign that God will keep his covenant with David. There's his sign that God will send one from David's line to obey God and to rule over the people in the kingdom. There's your sign. He will be a virgin born child and you will call him Emmanuel, God with us. But in Isaiah 9, 6, we see that name Emmanuel fully explained to us. This is probably what you put on your Christmas cards, right? Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So the sign is this virgin born son whose name will be God with us. But as God with us, he's going to be a wonderful counselor. He's going to be a mighty God. He's going to be the everlasting father. And he's going to be the Prince of Peace. Well, what do those four compound words and names mean? I'm so glad you asked. As the wonderful counselor, he is the strategist for the war at hand. He is the one as the wonderful counselor who will orchestrate the victory for God's people. He is not only the wonderful counselor, but he's also the mighty God. Which means he is a warrior. This virgin born child whose name is Emmanuel is not only the strategist to win the war, but he's also the mighty warrior who engages in the war and secures the victory of the war for the people of God. You better rev them ameners up. Because I hadn't said his name yet, but you know who I'm talking about. He's also the everlasting Father. He's God with us. He's the everlasting Father, which means that He cares for us with a paternal care, a fatherly care. That fatherly care, there's a few things that come along with that. One is He protects us. He provides for us and He preserves us. As Don read in Romans 7, who is that? It is the incomparable one. But he's also the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. 
Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that as the wonderful counselor, he was the strategist who orchestrated the war plan. As the mighty warrior, he's the one that engaged in the battle and secured it. As the everlasting father, he's one with the father and he shows paternal care for those in his trust. But he grants us something. It's called peace. That's the reason during this time of the year we say peace on earth. And goodwill toward man. But I do not want you to forget that peace did not come by a passive human. Oh, you didn't hear that. No. Oh, Jesus, sweet baby. No. Jesus. Mighty warrior, Jesus, conquering king, Jesus, the Lord of lords, the king of kings, the Lord of hosts. He enters into battle and he destroys sin and death through his life and through his resurrection. Your peace came through war. Jesus declared it. Jesus fought it. Jesus won it. And now you and I have peace. With God. And therefore we have peace with one another. That's the promise. That's the promise. What about the fulfillment? Man, this is, this is God is kind of anticipating somebody, doesn't it? This kind of got us hopeful and looking forward to something happening. Because Assyria is encroaching upon these southern two tribes and they're threatening to take away their life. And God goes silent for 750 years. You want me to run that back? He's got us all hot here, doesn't he? He's got us worked up. And then he goes silent for seven and a half centuries. Generations come and generations go, and generation come and generation go, and generation come. Seven generations, more than that, have come and gone. It looks like, at this point, that God the Father, through Isaiah, is a liar. You saw the promise. There's no fulfillment. 750 And then something happens. Something wild and weird and not natural. So let's look to one of the original disciples' interpretation of what happened. In Matthew 1, beginning in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they had come together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place. To fulfill 
what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to the son, and they called his name Jesus. Matthew's name was Levi. Levi was a tax collector. Can I get a witness? How many of you enjoy the tax collector? Me either. But Jesus converted this tax collector. He saved him. How many of you know that God saves sinners? Three of you know that. More of you need to raise your hand. I have plenty of work left to do here, apparently. And his name became Matthew. And Matthew wrote this gospel, the gospel of Matthew, to Jewish people. Mark wrote to the Romans. Luke wrote to the Greeks. John wrote this like open letter. But Matthew wrote specifically and particularly to the Jewish people. After 750 years, Matthew, this Jewish man who was converted, he wrote this gospel, and one of the first things he said is, Hey, do y'all remember when Isaiah said? One of the first things he said. So that tells me, and it should tell you, that these Jewish people were waiting and longing for the fulfillment of Isaiah 7 verse 14. Because he had not come yet. Do you see? And to describe the irony and how weird this night was, he says, well, the birth of Jesus took place this way. That's Matthew setting you up. Because the next thing he says is, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. All right, let's stop. There's no such thing as betrothal today. We call it engagement. But you can knock off an engagement. Right? You can be engaged to 78 different people and not marry any of them. Right? I, I uh, saw someone yet, uh, this past week and, and uh, they said, oh, this is my fiance. And I said, great. Uh, when, when's, the, when's the big day? And they're like, oh, we hadn't picked a date. <laughs> Why'd you get engaged? <laughs> Isn't that like the next thing you do? You're like, hey, we're, we're acting actually going to do this? The point here is betrothal is much, much more than just an engagement. A betrothal is you're legally obligated. And, and I know that this is hard for us to think because we're American, you know, and like everybody's free and I got my rights and blah, blah, blah and all that. But if your daddy, girls, if your daddy didn't give you to that man, you weren't going Amen. <laughs> Stress on men. At any rate, we can still be Old Testament today is what I'm saying. Uh, but at any rate, this is a legal contract between the father and Joseph. Where the father has pledged to give Mary, but now Mary's pregnant. And Joseph knows... It ain't him. I didn't write the Bible. Don't shoot the messenger. But Joseph knows this. So now she's pregnant and he's going, wait a second. Your daddy gave you to me, but I'm still preparing to take you as my wife. So there's this betrothal, this legally obligating period of time where we're legally obligated, but we're not married. So there's no consummating of that legal obligation. Y'all all right? And you come into me and you tell me now that you're pregnant. That doesn't make good sense. So you see the irony of this day? You see that this, this, this makes no sense. And so Joseph, the scripture tells us here, Joseph, being a just man, decides to divorce her quietly. They haven't, as the scripture says, they haven't come together yet. They haven't celebrated with a ceremony, and they haven't consummated their coming together yet, but she's pregnant, so he's a good guy, this Joseph. 
And so he says, eh, we'll just do this quietly. I, I just, I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't want a part of it. And then the scripture says that an angel of the Lord appeared to him. I'll be honest with you, with a western mind like mine, a western mind like yours, an angel appearing, I'm thinking if an angel appears to me, I'm dead. That's what I think. An angel appears to him. This is a supernatural occurrence. And he says to him, Joseph, son of whom? David. Man, David keeps coming up, doesn't he? He comes up in Isaiah. He comes up in Romans. He comes up in Matthew. It's David just keeps coming up. Son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Let that sink in. And then he says, She will bear this son. And you will call his name what? The most beautiful name on earth. Now, why are you going to call him Jesus? Look at what the verse says. Because Jesus will save his people from their sins. Look, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Assyria was never the real problem. Are you listening? Rome was never the real problem. The government put on the shoulders of Jesus battled a different government. Not any government from this world. It was the government of sin and death. And as our wonderful counselor our mighty warrior, our everlasting father, and our prince of peace, Jesus engaged in battle to overthrow a government that you can't see with your eyes. That's the government of sin and death. So now the angel of the Lord who knows this is God's purpose and plan says, you're going to call him Jesus because he's going to take away the sins of his people. Now, an interesting thing that you see here, I love the name of Jesus. Do you hear me? I love the name of Jesus. But Jesus ain't his name. Jesus is a Greek way of saying a Hebrew word. Jesus' name is Yeshua. In Hebrew, it's translated Joshua. Oh, don't, 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 don't let go of me right now. Do you remember the Old Testament book of Joshua? What did Joshua do? Joshua led the people into battle. And he defeated the enemies of God and settled the promised land with the people of God. What is Jesus' Hebrew name? It is Yeshua, Joshua. Why? Because Jesus leads his people into battle. Jesus defeats sin and death for us, thus securing the promised land and our settlement in it for eternity. I now hear that your ameners are working. Now look at that last phrase. You can call his name Jesus. But all of this took place. All of this took place for what? For one glorious reason. To fulfill what God said 750 years before. Do you see the promise? Do you see the fulfillment? All this took place to fulfill. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel. That is what Christmas is about. Amen. Now, how do you take this and apply it? Real quick, because I'm already out of time. 
The first way is that you need to understand time as God does. You need to understand time as God does. God uses time. And, and, and how providential today to hear the song about the goodness of God and, and be spurred on by verses from Psalm 23 and Proverbs 16 about the goodness of God and the things that happen in your life and, and, and seeing that God works all those things for good. And now we hear the application that was written long before there was fever or a fill-in singer. And we see here that God uses time to develop. That is, God is always working good even though you don't see it. So we have to understand time like God does. Which is hard, isn't it? It's hard. That's not the way that I look at time. I look at time like, why am I waiting on y'all kids? Why am I waiting on you wife? Come on, come on, we gotta go, we gotta go. There's a reason we take two cars to church. Amen? Amen. (laughs) Boy, that's going to hurt when we get home. (laughs) Sometimes it just comes and you go, why? Why did you do that, Kevin? Why did you do that? The, uh, the second application is this. You need to allow time to develop your patience. Boy, you didn't come to church to hear that today, did you? 750 years before he fulfilled his promise. God uses time. We've got to understand time the way he does. God is developing situations. He's developing good. He's working good So we have to allow time to develop our patience. And we have to trust that God will do what he said he will do. Even though it took him 750 years to do it. And then lastly is this. We have to trust the Lord to keep his word. Can I be honest with you? And, and this is not a slight to anybody in my life, and please don't take it that way. It's just, a, it's just a general statement. You know, there are not very many people in the world who keep their word. Have you noticed that? Very, very, very few people will say, and then they do what they say. There's always a reason, there's always an excuse, there's always a justification. But God's not like that. So we have our human experiences where people let us down. But with God, He doesn't let us down. In fact, as that song sang today from Leslie, you cannot look back on the things in your life and say, God did that. No, you look back and say, I didn't like it, but I sure am glad it happened. Trust the Lord. May God bless the preaching of his word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, please take and seal in our hearts the truth that we have heard. Develop us by your grace and make us gracious to others. Bless these dear ones with your peace and dismiss them now in your grace. That's our prayer. And we make it in Jesus' name. Amen.